Okay, well, hello everybody who's out there listening. Um, I want to start by just thanking uh, Amy and Michelle for doing so much to uh, to make this conference happen. It's been great so far. Um, and I'll just introduce myself very briefly. Uh, I'm uh, Michael Pounds. I'm a faculty member here at Ball State. Uh, I'm one of the composition faculty. And uh, I also have kind of an unusual background. I have an engineering background. I did an engineering degree for my undergrad and, and worked as an engineer for a few years before I got into composition and music. Uh, so I come at, uh, at this all with a little different, uh, different uh, angle. And uh, I'm kind of fascinated by making things and building things. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, instrument building, uh, specifically focused on on guitars. Um, I'd uh, I'd like the uh, conversation here to be uh, less formal, and if any of you have questions, you know, feel free to uh, to type them in the chat, and uh, and I'd be happy to answer those as we go. Um, I also have probably too much to talk about today, and. Uh, I can talk a lot about some different instruments and some different possibilities and some different questions that a person might ask when they're building an instrument, uh, making some decisions about what to build and how to build it. Uh, but I also have a very specific uh, plan that I've created um, for a very specific build, and and uh, I have that uploaded to. A Google document and you can download those plans um, and so I can talk about that a little bit too we can kind of go through the step-by-step -step process just to just to give a little sneak preview of that uh, this is the instrument that I built specifically for this kind of workshop I designed this to be something that could be made in really just a few hours and uh, and try to keep things as, as simple as possible. Um, I've got it right now plugged into an amp. And this is specifically a, a, a slide instrument, so you can... Uh... So that's what it sounds like. It's, a, it's just a slide guitar with two strings, so it's, it's limited compared to a, a normal guitar, but it's a lot of fun, and I think it sounds pretty good, and it's pretty easy to build, and so we can talk about that more. Um, if any of you want to talk more about this, you know, let us know in the comments, and I can uh, have the more general conversation go a little bit quicker. But I'll try to pace myself. Um, so let's move forward, I guess, and... Uh, so, yeah, just an introduction. So I'm building instruments out of uh, things like cigar boxes and cookie tins and and uh, pieces of wood that I buy at the local hardware store. Um, and my philosophy here is, you know, I'm not trying to be a professional guitar maker. I'm, I'm in no way a, a professional woodworking expert or a professional luthier or anything like that. I'm just uh, I'm just messing around with this stuff and 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 uh, learning what I need to learn to to get by, um, and so all of you could could do the same I think. Um, materials can be quite inexpensive. Uh, you don't need a lot of really fancy tools. Mostly I work with hand tools, with the exception of uh, a power drill. Mostly um, I do have some other tools, but mostly I'm cutting everything with with hand saws. Um, filing things, sandpaper, uh, things like that. Um, and uh, I'm also buying inexpensive parts. Um, I've got a bunch of stuff in front of me. So for example, here's a, a little guitar tuner. Um, you can buy guitar tuners for two to three dollars a piece, something like that. So I'm not trying to spend a lot of money. I'm trying to uh, do everything on a, on a low budget. Uh, and and uh, and the uh, the instrument I think sounds pretty good nonetheless. I I, I build things with uh, piezo pickups in them. I build things with electric guitar pickups. Uh, both of them can sound pretty good. I think um, the instruments are kind of quirky. They have limitations, you know, compared to a, a professional instrument. Uh, but 
I think you can still make a lot of great music with it. It can be part of the part of the fun. Also, it can inspire your own creativity to to work within those limitations. Um, every instrument I build seems to uh, seems to have its own its own uh, personality and and uh, play each one with a little different technique. And I think that's quite interesting. Um, also, these instruments can be, you can think of it as a kind of folk art. You know, you're working with recycled materials. You're working with, sometimes I go to antique stores and buy things in antique stores. Um, I think think they can really be beautiful instruments, too, and works of art in themselves. And uh, it's just really satisfying to build your own instrument and play it. And so, as I noted earlier, uh, please ask me questions as we go. Does anybody have any questions yet? If you do, go ahead and type them in the chat. Um, so I have some examples, uh, and uh, I've got some pictures here, and I also have the instruments sitting within reach. So this particular instrument in the picture is also in my hand here. Uh, and uh, this was the first instrument I built. And I found some plans online, and it's a simple uh, three-string slide guitar. The string action is quite high. There's a, a machine screw that serves as the nut. I've got some, some inexpensive uh, tuners here, and I've got, a, I've got another threaded rod, kind of bolt serving as a bridge. There's a piezo pickup inside the box and the volume knob and the strings come through the back and this was the first cigar box i bought at an antique store at some point and, and made it into a guitar um, so that was the first instrument i built i've got some pictures here i'll just kind of flip through these um, this instrument here is the the second uh, guitar I ever built and I can't show you that one because I actually gave that away to a friend and I, I I tend to miss it but I visit my friends periodically and so I just saw this guitar a few days ago in fact uh, but this is a similar instrument this time I put a uh, uh, an electric guitar pickup in it as you can see it's a little mini humbucker pickup but there's also a piezo pickup under the lid and there's a, a pickup selector switch so you can switch back and forth or get a combination of the two a volume and tone control this one I made a little uh, a little tailpiece out of a piece of angled aluminum, uh, but this one came out really well. It's got an oak neck. Uh, this is a third one. I have this one here as well, and I can I can play it for you if if anybody wants to hear it. Um, this instrument is a uh, is a four string. And it's a, it's a slide guitar. I, I primarily play this like a lap steel guitar. I originally got into this because I was starting to play lap steel. I inherited an old, uh, uh, like a 1941 Epiphone lap steel from my father. And, uh, and I, I got that one fixed up and started playing it. And then I started shopping around for lap steels. And I kept on seeing uh, people trying to sell these kinds of homemade instruments. And I thought, well, I can make those. Uh, so this one is, uh, let me see if I can find this one right next to me here. Yeah, so here's this instrument, and uh, this one again has a pretty high action, so I set it up like a lap steel guitar. The, uh, the bridge is a, 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 an old key, an antique key, sitting on a piece of oak. I've got a mini humbucker here. This mini humbucker can be split so that it turns into a single coil. And I've got a, a push-pull knob here for the tone to switch between those two settings. And um, the tailpiece here is an old hinge from uh, a kitchen cupboard. And uh, what else? I made a, made a nut out of angled aluminum. Got some traditional four-string tuners on the back. And uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll plug this one in and just play a few notes. I'm not going to try to impress you with my playing skills because I'm not really that good, but I have fun with it. Um, but I will play some notes. So 
I play this on my lap. You can play it this way, but I also play it on my lap like a lap steel guitar. And let me turn the amp on. So I hope you can all hope you can all hear that. Uh, I might play with a thumb pick or or uh, finger picks. And uh, sometimes I put these through effects a lot. Here's a little uh, little distortion. Yeah. So I think it sounds I think it sounds really good. Uh, it was one of my favorite instruments. Uh, I'll turn that off. Does anybody have any questions yet? I'm uh, I'm assuming that uh, Amy or somebody will will interject if anything comes up, right? Um, let's go on. Uh, here's another one. I threw this one together when I was teaching an instrument building class, and uh, something I I did pretty quickly. I have this one right here, and so this is a. This is a can, a tuna can, basically. Um, old hinge for a tailpiece. It's a one string. Uh, people tend to call these a diddly bow. Um, sort of long tradition of these kinds of instruments. This one is just built on some pieces of poplar. And uh, I have a screw serving as the nut, another little screw serving as a retainer. And uh, this one is kind of interesting because I used an eye bolt to... Uh, to serve as a tuner, so I just wrap the string around the eye bolt and tighten it up with a wing nut, um, <clears throat> which it's a fine thing to do. It works. Um, it's not as good as a guitar tuner, and it actually costs about the same as one of these cheap guitar tuners, so I don't know that I necessarily recommend this technique, but if you want to try it, it's uh, something. And, and it has a particularly metallic, metallic resonant sound um, from that tuna can. And it has a piezo pickup inside it, so this can be amplified as well. And it's got volume and tone controls. So that was a fun, fun project that I did pretty quickly as a demonstration for my students. Um, I kind of expanded on that with this instrument. And this one... Let's see, I'm opening up the chat window. Okay, so I see a question here. It says, for someone whose primary instrument isn't the guitar, can you explain what goes into choosing the materials used for the body, the nut, and the bridge? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, those are all, all excellent questions. So um, you will get different kinds of sounds depending on the choices you make. So, for example... Um, this instrument here uh, is made from a tobacco tin, and it's, I found this in, a, in an antique store. And the strings just pass through the bottom of it, and that's what resonates. And it's got a particularly bright, uh, a bright tinny sound. This one actually sounds pretty good, amplified too. It sounds really good with some distortion on it, actually. It has kind of a singing, sustaining quality. Um, this instrument has an electric guitar pickup uh, right here. It's underneath this wooden cover. I, I, I made this wooden cover and have a flat uh, electric guitar pickup underneath there. Um, so uh, getting back to the question, so the body of the instrument, is going to influence the sound a lot, especially if you're using a piezo pickup. Um, but even this can, even though I'm using an electric guitar pickup, it still has kind of a metallic sound just because of the way the strings vibrate with the body. And so if you're looking for something uh, that's a more metallic sound, something bright and tinny, you know, you can build an instrument out of tin. Uh, if you're building with, like this instrument this is a, a very simple basic cigar box um, I've got another one 
right here. And uh, this is a just something I picked. I, you can get these in a, in a cigar store if you happen to have any around. Um, you can go in. Sometimes they'll just give them to you. Sometimes they'll sell them to you for two, three, four dollars. Um, so this is really uh, probably made out of a kind of a fiberboard. Um, it works. Uh, it it gives you uh, uh, probably a warmer a warmer sound. It doesn't resonate the way uh, you know an acoustic guitar body would, but it uh, it, it has some resonance to it. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the uh, the sound will come from um, the way you mount it on a bridge and how rigid everything is. So if you want the instrument to sustain a lot. Uh, you want to mount it all very rigidly. This is particularly interesting. The uh, pictures I took of this guitar originally had this screw uh, as the uh, as the bridge, and I was experimenting, and I took this off and put this bigger bolt on there, and I actually got a better sound from the instrument with this bigger bolt. And there are some physics reasons for that. The strings are higher up from the body and they have a little more leverage when they vibrate the way a, a violin bridge might. There's a, a sharper break angle over that bridge uh, when the strings bend over it. Um, also the ends of the bolt are vibrating further away from this neck where the neck is uh, pushing up against the underside of the lid and so this part of the body on either side can vibrate more than the area around the neck and so having a larger bolt actually gave me a, a better sound. Um, <clears throat> and so those kinds of decisions affect the, uh, the sound. Um, this particular instrument, the one I just played for you before, this one has a lot of sustain. The box is, is very heavy and sturdy. It's very thick wood. Um, the neck uh, is made out of a mahogany, mahogany material. I uh, put an oak fingerboard uh, on top of that and it gives it more stiffness and this neck passes through right underneath that lid and pushes right up against the bottom of the lid the uh, tail piece is very rigid uh, the the bridge sitting on this piece of oak which is a very hard wood is very rigid and uh, it's got this metallic nut and so that means the whole thing sounds pretty bright and uh, and pretty well uh, sustaining and so that affects the sound. So um, I don't know. I've heard a lot of theories about guitar making, about how, you know, a maple neck compared to a mahogany neck will sound brighter and stiffer. And uh, and, and that may certainly be true. Uh, I've made some necks out of oak that are very heavy and very strong. I've made this particular neck here was made out of poplar. Uh, which is a very inexpensive wood and it's pretty soft um, and uh, and that might make it you know have a, a warmer sound perhaps um, I've made instruments with uh, bone nuts and so you can use a, a, a bone nut you don't need to use a screw for a nut you can have a more traditional uh, nut and then uh, you know people will say that something like bone will sound different than say a plastic nut I think a lot of that stuff is 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 pretty subtle and uh, so I would say, you know, just experiment with it. And, and uh, there's a little physics involved, of course, but, but you can also just experiment with it. Um, oh, here's another question. Uh, Thatcher Harrison, uh, you mentioned that you teach composition. Have you ever used any of your hand-built instruments uh, in a piece? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I do, yeah, I teach composition. I also... Um, I also uh, work with our students. We have an electroacoustic ensemble, Dr. Chan and I, uh, Patrick Chan. We, we, we play with a, a number of students, and uh, sometimes I'm playing a, a lap steel guitar that I didn't make, and a lot of times I play my homemade instruments. And so we certainly use them in our performances. A lot of those performances are, are um, you know, composed with graphic scores, uh, or they're improvisational in a, in a more loose manner. And uh, so I've done the homemade instruments for, for that kind of setting a lot. Um, I, I haven't really made like a, a real serious composition 
I would say with my with my homemade instruments yet um, I guess I get distracted uh, playing them and and uh, and uh, and building them uh, it is something in in my on my list for the near future to to probably do some uh, hybrid of of live performance and electronic music that that uses some of these cigar box guitars um, I've made instruments in the past that were uh, not guitars and and I've used those uh, in performance and in my own composition. So, for example, um, I did a piece that was based with uh, Arduino uh, microprocessing boards and uh, infrared distance sensors, and I, I mounted several of these infrared distance sensors in pieces of aluminum, and and uh, I came up with a with an interface where I could plug all the cables in and everything. And uh, I played that instrument by by basically kind of like a theremin, you know, moving my hands up and down over the sensors and each sensor triggered a different sound and how high my hand was uh, affected uh, the sound coming out of my computer. And so I've written that kind of piece for my, my homemade sort of computer interface based instruments. Um, so hopefully I'll be doing more cigar box kind of music uh, in, in the future in one of my compositions. Um, Okay, I'll put the chat off to the side. Um, yeah, so let's go. Yeah, here's uh, another instrument. I notice I have these numbered. I've been keeping track of which instrument is which. Uh, this one uh, says JM's four string fretless. I've got this one here as well. You can see in this instrument, I was um, getting more serious about my headstock and trying to get a little fancier. I also finished the finished the neck. Sorry, I bumped the microphone. I think I finished the neck with a true oil. Uh, it has a kind of a glossy hard finish. Uh, makes the, the the grain of the wood look real nice. This is a this is a maple neck with a uh, with an oak fretboard and uh, these bits of wood on the side are are mahogany. Again, all this wood came from the local hardware store and they the wood doesn't really cost that much you can buy a, a piece of maple like this at our local uh, menards for about uh, I don't know five dollars something like that six dollars and so it isn't that expensive um, this wood uh, is uh, sold as a, a one by two they call it one inch by two inch it's actually three quarter inches by one and a half inches i think it's the one by two is the rough dimension before they plane the wood down and make it smooth um, but this is about right for say a four string instrument if you wanted a six string instrument you probably need to start with a larger piece of wood um, this instrument um, uses this this box this is a again a cheaper uh, cheaper cigar box that's made out of kind of a fiber board, um, but this this one has a lid that's very much reinforced. I have strips of oak glued underneath the lid here so that this uh, electric guitar tailpiece can be mounted very firmly on there. And uh, the uh, you can see some sorry you can see some uh, wood screws screwing the lid down into the neck. So the neck is very rigidly up against the underside of the lid and there's oak reinforcement. There are also uh, corner posts glued into each corner and you can see the lid is screwed down into those corner posts. So this is a very sturdy instrument and it has a lot of sustain as a result. Um, I wanted to get away from just the uh, just uh, playing it like a lap steel so I have a lower action on this instrument and I put a more traditional bone nut. So this one can actually be fingered, uh, you know, just like a fretless bass might be. I can play a few, few notes on this one to give you a sense of how this one sounds. Oh, I still have my distortion on there. Let me check that out. So... So this has the advantage of, and it has that fretless sound where the note kind of blooms a little bit. And you can slide, you can slide, which is cool, or get, get a nice vibrato. And you can also play this with the slide. 
Yeah, so, um, so I like this instrument a lot. This is the one, uh, I'm planning to modify this further and stick an Arduino microprocessing board inside and put a bunch of sensors on this and uh, use this in conjunction with my computer, do a lot of computer processing of the sound and then use the electronic sensors to manipulate the sound coming from the computer. So I've got a lot of plans for this particular instrument here. Um, Okay, let me put this down. And, uh, okay, what do we have here? This is... Uh, this is a instrument made out of a cookie tin. I made a little banjo out of it. Um, this has an, an oak neck. Um, we renovated our kitchen a few years back, and this piece of oak is actually the uh, a piece of oak that came from our kitchen cupboards. So this was part of our house in the past. Um, I have kind of enlarged headstock here, uh, four tuners, traditional bone nut. And I should mention the fretting, too. Um, a lot of the instruments I've made have been fretless. This one, I, I put these frets on, and so that was something I had to learn how to do. You have to have the right kind of saw and, and uh, drill some or saw some little slots in the right place and uh, uh, there's a you know little little bit to learn but it's not it's not terribly hard and then you have to file the ends of the frets and all of that so uh, that's kind of an interesting interesting process but it's doable it isn't so hard this one also has some kind of slick fret markers on there I've got some small ones on the other side there to uh, so, so I know which uh, where my frets are. Um, I did these by uh, uh, using a kind of a, a paste. It's a it's called a water putty, and uh, I just drilled some little holes in the fretboard and uh, mixed up this paste and smeared it in there and then sanded it smooth. And it looks like these uh, clay fret dots that you might find in an old Fender guitar or something like that. Works pretty well. Um, this instrument is has a you know, decent acoustic sound. It can also be plugged in. Um, I've got this tuned like a banjo. So you can play banjo chords on it. Uh, it's op open G, D, G, B, D. So I like this instrument a lot. Um, it doesn't sound great plugged in, but it's it's not bad. Um, I'm thinking about installing an electric guitar pickup in here somehow at some point. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a really nice instrument to play. I enjoy noodling around on this one. So, okay, that's, uh, that's a lot of the instruments that I built. Not every one, but most of them. Um, I'll run down. Well, let me stop now. Um, does anyone, uh, maybe I should kind of jump ahead and get into this uh, specific plan for the, the instrument. Um, so I'm going to, I think I'm going to stop my share for a, a moment here. Uh, 28 minutes in. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm going to kind of move forward. I have in my PowerPoint presentation a bunch of questions you might you might talk about or you might think about as you're building um, but I've kind of already mentioned some of these things and I'd like to get into this uh, specific plan so let me do something here I'm gonna paste in the chat um, I have to find my link okay so this link here should take you to my Google Drive and you should be able to download a PDF document. And the PDF document will have very specific instructions for how to build this guitar. And so I think I'll kind of walk you through that. Um, I'll try not to go. I probably should go uh, till about 20 after and then stop for questions. I would guess that's probably the time frame we're looking at here. Um, so I'm going to share again, and this time 
look at uh, a PDF document. Let's see. All right, so I did my best uh, in typing up this document to give you basically everything you need to know. Um, when I was thinking about doing an instrument building workshop, I was originally planning to have some people come into our studios and actually uh, actually build an instrument. Um, uh, okay. Okay, great. Uh, the link is on Facebook and YouTube. Um, yeah, so I was uh, I was hoping that I could get some people to actually build an instrument in real time, like all in a half a day or so. And uh, and so I built this instrument, trying to keep it simple, trying to document everything I did. And uh, uh, I I was hoping, and I I may do this ag again at some point, and and actually do that. Um, I'm a little I can't handle too many people doing that, I think, unless I have a lot of tools, because if everybody's sharing the same tools, probably it's hard to get it done efficiently, so it's a little bit tricky. But I timed myself, and when I built this instrument, the time I spent actually working on it was somewhere between four and five hours. And so I could build this up in a, in a day, and you could too if you were, if you were working quickly. Um, so here's what you need to do. So... Um, Step one is measure and mark the neck. Uh, and so for a neck, you could use something like this. This is a, 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 a poplar dowel that I got at the hardware store. And this is seven eighths of an inch thick. It's, um, it's pretty strong, it, it flexes a little bit, but it's okay because we're not fretting this instrument, so a little bit of flex in the neck doesn't hurt anything. So you can use a stick like this. This is a four foot length, so you're gonna need to cut it to length. On, on the instrument that I built here, this is actually, this is actually the handle from a rake. Um, this was from my shed. I've used this handle to rake my yard many times. Um, the rake kind of fell apart, and I, I used the handle in an instrument. And so this is a rake handle. It's got yellow paint on it. It's a little bit scratched up. Um, and so you need to measure it out. And I don't really have a great drawing showing all the measurements, but I can tell you what I did basically. I've got about an inch and a half down to the first tuner, about an inch and a half between tuners, about two inches to my nut. And then from the nut to the bridge, uh, that's your scale length. That's what in the guitar world we, we call a scale length. And um, you know, my, uh, my Stratocaster at home is a 25 and a half inches, I believe. This one is 23 inches. So I decided to make it a little bit shorter. You can make it anything you want. You can make it 25 inches if you want. A lot of my instruments are 25 inches. This one's 23. Um, so measure from the nut to the bridge and as you're doing this you're making marks on your neck so you know where everything lays out and then you have to decide where your bridge is going to sit on your box this I decided to put right about two and a quarter inches from the end of the box so I made another mark right where the end of the box will be and then I measured an inch and a half for the tail piece to stick out and uh, and then I cut my stick uh, to to the proper length um, and there's a picture and uh, the next step is probably one of the trickier parts and that is preparing to mount these tuners in here and so you can see there's a, a flat surface where the tops of the tuners are and there's a flat surface on the back you have to remove some material and I have an example here because I was experimenting on another instrument I built. I built a one string instrument and this was a piece I cut off. This is a mop handle, by the way. Um, but you have to flatten the instrument by removing some material at the top and the bottom. Actually, this would be the top and this would be the bottom. I'm sorry, 
there we go, at the top and the bottom. And so there are different ways you can do that. I mentioned in my instructions you can use a Forstner bit. This is a Forstner bit. You can put this in your drill and you can uh, drill into your material and remove material that way. You can also just take a, a saw and uh, cut some grooves in here and then take a chisel and chisel out the material and then take a file and file it all flat and, uh, uh, and that, that can help. But you basically need something like this. You take your, your guitar tuners. Um, hang on a second. I'm looking for... Here's one. You take a guitar tuner like this. You ultimately need to have a hole in here where the guitar tuner can fit into that hole. And so that th this is part of the probably the trickiest part, but you have to get it to be about uh, five eighths of an inch thick or nine sixteenths of an inch thick. You drill a pilot hole where you want your tuner to be, something small like a like a eighth of an inch or something like that, and then you need to drill a larger hole for your tuner. And there are different kinds of tuners. This particular tuner here probably needs like a quarter inch hole, and this one is like a 10 millimeter hole, or if you're using uh, uh, inches, this would be about 3 eighths of an inch. And you might have to file out the hole a little bit with a file to make it a little bit bigger to fit the tuner in there. Um, and so you get this flat, you drill your tuner holes, and then you have a place where you can mount the tuner on the back. You can see these particular tuners, notice there's a, a left tuner and a right tuner. The tuner tuning pegs come off in different directions. And also notice there's a mounting screw on each one. And these particular tuners have mounting screws that are in line with the tuner. And that can be good when you're using a stick like this because then you can sink this screw right into the, into the stick. Uh, this particular tuner I have is a little bit different because it has a mounting screw that goes off to the side and that poses a little bit of a problem if you're say going to put this tuner on this stick you can see the hole doesn't really line up with the stick so you have two choices either you get yourself a different tuner or else you kind of angle your tuner like this and then you have a place you can mount your mounting screw and maybe your tuner comes off at an angle, it'll still work, uh, but you could choose your tuner differently. Here's another one. This one has mounting holes that are in line with the tuner, so this would work well on a stick also. Um, so the process of mounting the tuner is going to involve finding out where that mounting hole goes, marking it with a pencil, drilling a little pilot hole for a small screw that comes with the tuner, so that you can put the tuner back here, screw the little screw in, and then these tuners have a, a little nut that sits on top and, and tightens up on the front. Uh, so, as I said, that's probably about the trickiest part of this instrument build. Um, I'm going to move forward in my plan here. Here's a picture of this stick before the tuners were mounted, after I flattened it and drilled the uh, drilled the holes for those tuners. Um, I have some links in this document. There are a couple companies where I buy these parts from. One of them is uh, CB Giddy. They're based in uh, New Hampshire, and they sell tons of stuff for building your own instruments, and it's a really, really good company. Um, they have a lot of instructional information on their website. And uh, they even have a little uh, a little live show they do every Friday where they play their instruments and sing songs and show videos and things like that. Um, this other company is MGB Guitars. Uh, this guy is down in Florida, and uh, I buy a lot of stuff from him because he sells parts that are pretty inexpensive, and if you buy anything over $10, he'll ship it for free if you're living in the U.S., um, uh, but uh, yeah, these are both excellent sources to buy these inexpensive parts, and they have a lot of information about how to do things. Um, I talked through the tuners already. Here's a picture of the tuner mounted on the back um, with the mounting screws already installed. Uh, let me scroll down. 
to the next step. I, I note here in my instructions, if I'm not in a hurry, I like to drill a slightly smaller hole and then I, I enlarge those. So I have a round file I stick in the hole and I kind of file the hole out. And I also have a little reaming tool uh, that you can stick in there and twist it and it gives you a nice nice round hole and, and you can kind of ream out the hole and make it a little bit larger. I'm a, a bit of a perfectionist. Sometimes that's a problem, sometimes it's good. Uh, but I really like the tuners to fit in there just perfectly. It's not necessary though. Um, low, step five is locate and drill pilot holes for the mounting screws. I talked about that a little bit. Uh, number six is locate and drill the holes for the strings. So if you're going to have the strings pass through the box or pass through the, the, the stick at the end like this. Um, so these holes are, they're spaced apart about the spacing of the strings. You have to decide how far apart you want your strings to be spaced. I chose to space these about a half an inch apart. And so my holes are about a half of an inch apart. And the holes uh, go through go through the stick at an angle. So I go right through the center of the stick. And so this hole comes out over, over on the other side of the stick. And this hole comes out on this side of the stick and they kind of crisscross. So I stagger these holes, I think it's about three eighths of an inch apart so they don't pass through one another as they pass through the center of the stick. Um, so drill those holes. These are just uh, small holes. They can be like a sixteenth of an inch. I have these little brass ferrules um, mounted in there and these are things I bought at the CB Giddy company and they're just little brass uh, bushings that you can just shove into the holes and I think they're for like an eighth inch hole so I drilled eighth inch and I shoved these little pieces of brass in there and uh, you can also use pop rivets you can buy like an eighth inch pop rivet and pop the stem out and shove the rivet in there and that that can work too but that's optional I'm kind of going through this quickly um, I don't see any questions in the chat if anybody hasn't has any questions in the chat please feel free to to jump in Here's a picture of the holes right after I drilled them, uh, before I put the ferrules in there. Uh, step seven, uh, make a groove for the nut. So I had the nut location marked on the stick here, and I need a groove so that that screw can just rest in that groove. So I just took a saw, made a little slit, and then I took a round file, and I filed it out and made it larger, and I decided how deep I want that screw to sit. And uh, and then it just rests in there. So the the nut is not glued in place. It's just sitting in there. The string tension holds it in place. Same thing with the bridge. I did not glue the bridge in place. It's just a floating bridge. Just the tension of the strings holds it in place. If you need to adjust the intonation, you can uh, push the bridge forward or backward on the instrument. Um, let's move forward. This is. Number eight. This can be a little bit tricky. Um, this is where you're going to pass the stick through the box, so you need a hole in the box that's the same diameter as the stick. And for that, I use this Forstner bit. You can see it in the picture. You can see one here. And uh, so I drill a little pilot hole where I want the center of the hole to be, and then this one is the same diameter as the stick. And I have an extra box here so I can kind of demonstrate where that might be. So if I were going to do it on this box, I'd look at how thick this lid is, and I'd make sure that that, that hole is going to be no higher than the underside of that lid. When I stick the stick through the box, I want the stick to be right up against the underside of the lid. So I have to measure the location carefully. Of course, you have to center it on on, uh, on the side to side on the box. And then if this lid is, say, an eighth of an inch thick, then you just take your hole and you drop it down an eighth of an inch so that the stick goes right under the lid. You need to do that on both ends, here and here. And you can see there's a drilled hole in the picture. And then you can see that my stick is passing through the box right below the lid, and that happens on both both ends of my box. Oops, sorry about that. Um, here's a question. 
what would happen sonically if it wasn't centered? Um, yeah, actually, uh, you could put the holes wherever you want. You know, a lot of this is, uh, there's kind of a cliche. If you, if you go on YouTube, you can find a lot of videos about building cigar box guitars. You can find a lot of uh, websites talking about it and a lot of uh, discussions online. And one of the common things they say is, there are no rules like you can really do whatever you want and so um theoretically you know you could you could not only not center this but you could put your neck through the box at an angle i've seen people do that um but so it, it doesn't really matter if it's centered or not it's just an aesthetic thing sometimes i've seen a box where there are there are stripes across the top of the box and people intentionally offset the neck to just to line up with the stripes on the box and so that's part of the creativity of it and the fun of it it's, so it's not 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 really critical. Um, sure. Uh, so the next one says locate and drill a hole for the jack. So yeah, this this box I mean, you could make an acoustic instrument and not electrify it at all. I like to pass my instruments through guitar pedals and into computers and things like that. And so I want to have a pickup usually on the instruments that I build. And so this one has a piezo pickup installed, and I had to decide where to put the jack. And that's a, an interesting question because you could put it under here, you could put it on the front, you could put it back here, and you have to think about maybe how you're going to play the instrument. I like to cradle this between my knees like a banjo, like this, and so the 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 jack comes out sort of down below and if i have an electric guitar cable sticking it out sticking out it won't interfere with my legs and so that was part of my decision on where i put the jack here it's really how you're going to play it um, you have to drill this same size that matches your jack you can measure that and pick a drill that fits it um, here's a picture of the jack installed um, i'm starting to get close to the end of my time so i'm going to kind of zip through uh, the other parts. Uh, some of you may know how to solder, some of you may not. Um, you can buy pickups that are pre-soldered. I've got one here that I bought. I think this probably came from MGB. Um, so yeah, it's all kind of tangled up here. So this is a piezo, piezo element with the wires already soldered onto it and this is soldered onto a volume a volume potentiometer and there is the jack already soldered up for me so you can buy it that way if you don't like to solder if you know how to solder you can just buy the jack separately and just solder the wires onto your jack um, and it also says here i can't really get into this too much because we're running out of time but it says solder the pickup the jack and a capacitor i'm recommending you get a 0 0.010 microfarad capacitor and put it between the black wire and the red wire uh, on your pickup and that will act as a low pass filter and kind of mellow out some of the more harsh high frequencies and cause your instrument to feed back a little bit less and uh, so this is optional but it's something that you could do um, how do you install these? You can see in this picture, I've got this piezo pickup. It's just glued onto the lid. I used hot melt glue, glued it onto the lid. You can see the wire going down straight to the jack, passes underneath the neck. And, uh, uh, and you can put these wherever you want. I like to put it like right under the bridge, uh, usually maybe on the, on the lower lower string side since they pick up high frequencies a little better than low frequencies you might get a more balanced sound um, when you mount the stick in the box here you pass it through the box and i've got two screws one here and one here holding the lid to the stick and basically i just got some wood screws and i marked my center locations about an inch from the end of the box and I just drilled a little pilot hole right down into the uh, into the neck and then just sink the screws down. And that holds the stick to the lid. And uh, basically the tension of the strings holds the lid closed here. So uh, so this won't open up. But if I remove the strings, I could I could uh, take these screws off and pop open the box if I needed to. But that kind of holds it all together. Uh, 
this says install here's a picture of one of the screws install the tuners we've already talked about that so i won't talk about that again uh, string retaining screws i've got two screws right here on the neck and those screws pull the strings down so they make an angle over the nut and they also maintain the spacing of the strings before they pass through the tuner so i just drill a couple pilot holes in there and space these strings apart about a half an inch here and uh, and pass the strings underneath those screws they're not going down all the way into the stick there's a little space underneath so that would serve like your string trees on a fender guitar or something and then install your strings they pass through the back go over the bridge over the nut around your tuners i'm sure you all know how to install strings if you're guitar players uh, I've got this tuned to G and D, so this is like the A string on a guitar and the D string of a guitar. Um, this is a little bit shorter scale, so I might want a little, little thicker string. Um, I use uh, a string tension calculator and figure out what thickness of string is going to give me about 18 to 20 pounds of tension in my, in my strings. And then I just go to the local music store and I buy single strings that are the size I want. Uh, mark your fret locations. There's an online fret calculator you can use. You can also buy some templates. I've got mine marked here with just little bits of uh, painter's tape here. Uh, just the 3rd, 5th, 7th, 9th, and 12th uh, frets marked here for reference. And you can do that any way you want. You can use a wood burning tool, use a marker, paint it, uh, and then play with a slide and you can use a lot of different slides. This is a this is a metal spacer I bought at the hardware store for about two bucks. It's a pretty good slide. I've got ceramic slides, I've got glass slides. Any slide you want works. Um, okay, so that's a really fast pass through uh, these instructions, which hopefully you, you can download. If any of you can't download this document for some reason, you can just shoot me an email. Uh, my email is at the beginning of my presentation. It's uh, mspounds, M-S-P-O-U-N-D-S, at gmail.com, and I'd be happy to send you, uh, send you the instructions. And if any of you have any questions about doing anything, building anything, I'd be happy to talk to any of you about it. mspounds at gmail.com. That's correct. Yes, that's, that's the address. Please contact me. I love talking about this stuff. I'm kind of obsessed with it. It's fun. And uh, I'd be happy to offer advice or, or uh, if you build an instrument, I'd be happy to take a look at what you're doing. Any other questions? I'm going to stop talking now and I'll stop my share here. Thank you so much, Michael. You're welcome. That was amazing. Um, I'm just looking online. Um, and seeing if there's any more questions for you. That's kind of a lot to talk about in a very yeah. <laughs> short amount of time. So uh, I, I exactly. hope everybody was able to follow along. Well, if they can't, of course, these videos will be archived. So people can always go back and listen again. Okay, sure, sure. I see Michelle said she was going to ask about strings, but I answered that. Yeah, you can use these string tension calculators. And uh, you can also just experiment. You can just take any strings out of a guitar pack and string them up and just, just see what, what pitch they want to be. And you can tune these any way you want. Great. I don't see any further questions, so we might uh, uh, stop here. We'll have to go down to Sursa for uh, Nathan Fisher's lecture. Excellent. Okay. Well, it's been fun, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from some people, I hope. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael. Okay. Take care.
Good afternoon. Um, welcome to this uh, presentation on Las Guitarras Azules by Aaron Travers. Um, this is Aaron Travers, uh, Associate Professor of Composition at Indiana University Jacobs School of Music. My name is Nathan Fisher. I'm a guitarist and a career specialist also at Indiana University Jacobs School of Music. Um, Aaron is going to start our presentation off. Thank you, Nathan. So uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, how we're going to organize this, I'm going to start talking about how we put this, or how I put this piece together with uh, Nathan's collaboration. And then Nathan is going to discuss the more technical aspects of performing the concerto. So a little, a little bit of background about the piece. So Nathan and I had previously worked on a couple of solo guitar pieces before I came to him with the idea of writing the concerto. And he came right back to me with the idea of incorporating flamenco into this because he was in the middle of studying flamenco and his techniques. And so I thought this was a fantastic idea. Uh, so he started uh, playing different recordings for me of people like Pepe Romero and uh, Paco Peña. He played, uh, he demonstrated certain uh, flamenco techniques on his guitar and he also showed me uh, some flamenco transcriptions by Juan Martin uh, which provided a really nice foundation for how to notate many of these strumming patterns. In 2007, we were awarded a uh, commission from the Frome Foundation and under the auspices of the Fondation William Walton. I traveled to Ischia in the Bay of Naples where I began work on the concerto and I uh, got to meet the uh, very fiery, got to meet the, got to meet the very, fiery widow of William Walton, known simply as Lady Walton. In 2010, uh, the concerto was premiered at uh, Indiana University by the New Music Ensemble under David Zubay and uh, with uh, Nathan Fisher as soloist. So now I'd like to discuss how the concerto was put together and what aspects of flamenco were drawn into it. So I'm going to start with the form. So. In my research uh, on flamenco, I came across an article called El Compas Flamenco, a phylogenetic analysis written by multiple authors. The crux of the article was an analysis of different 12-8 rhythmic patterns, known as the compas. They are found in five different flamenco song forms, and that which uh, and these five that they analyzed were the bulerias, the fandango, guajiras, segarias, and the solear. And they used two different distance measures to sort of compare and contrast these different um, uh, uh, rhythmic patterns. These were the chronotonic distance and the directed swap distance. I'm not gonna dwell on these measures um, in, 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 uh, on their own. However, I will say that the, these measures allowed the authors to postulate a potential ancestral rhythm um, from which these other um, rhythmic patterns were derived, or at least, at least related. They then took these different patterns and arranged them in a kind of family tree uh, according to their distance, that is their difference from the uh, ancestral rhythm. And so this uh, structure that they created uh, from farthest to nearest is as follows, starting with the bulerias, then the solea, the segarias, the guajiras, and finally the fandango. After that, the fandango is very, very similar to their postulated ancestral rhythm. I use this as the basis for the form of my own concerto. And so, as you see on the slide above, this is the form of my concerto. It starts with an introduction, followed by the bulerias, which is a very fast uh, song form. Then the solea, which is a moderately fast or uh, moderate uh, tempo. Then uh, a cadenza, then the segarias, which is a very slow, uh, very slow form and often is sung in tradition, uh, which in the middle of that, we have a second cadenza. This is followed by the guajiras, which is fast again, a third, a third cadenza, and then finally a canto, which is very slow. Now, I do want to mention a little bit about the canto. This is a concerto for guitar, soprano, and uh, large ensemble. And the canto represents the first entrance of the soprano solo, in fact, the only entrance of the soprano. The idea was that uh, 
for me, flamenco at its core is as much of a vocal genre as it is a dance genre. And so I wanted the form to work slowly towards the roots of flamenco. And so in this way, I'm using the, the singer as the representation of that sort of primal form or primal state. The text, by the way, comes from a poem by Pablo Neruda, uh, La Calle Desruida, The Ruined Street, uh, from which the concerto draws its title, Las Guitarras Azules, which is the last three words of the poem. Now I'd like to talk as briefly as I can about the idea of compas, or the rhythmic pattern. So each of the song forms that I used in my uh, concerto um, for the most part retains the compas associated with it. So for instance, the burrarias has the following compas with the accents on uh, beats three, seven, eight, 10, and 12. So it sounds like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Now in practice, we as listeners often perceive this pattern as starting on beat 12 rather than beat one. So it has a kind of one, two, three, five, Now, if we compare that to the solea, you can notice that bulleres and solea, although the speeds are different, the compas is very similar. Simply, the accent on beat seven in the bulleres is moved back to beat six on the solea. So we have a pattern that starts 12, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. This pattern, by the way, is in, in this particular form, it is identical to that of the Guajiras, which is one of the reasons why in the Solea in particular, I decided not to follow the compas very closely. I used the Solea primarily as a kind of transition into the first cadenza and then into the Segurias. So, now that we've, un that we've understood the role of compas in the concerto, let's talk about, finally, the, um, the harmonic aspects of the concerto. So one of the unusual features of this concerto is that it uses quite an extensive scordatura. In fact, four out of the six strings are retuned. Really three, if you think about it, since the detuning the E string down to D is so common, it's practically not a scordatura. But we have the tuning of D, A, E. So the D string is tuned up a whole step, G, B flat, and E flat. Now, I had a reason for doing this. That is, that in many of the harmonies in flamenco, there's often an added second, flat second scale degree in the harmonies. And so this particular tuning allows me to incorporate um, flat second scale degrees on both A and D modes while using a maximum number of open strings. As such, I wanted to design all of the harmonic material around this scordatura. And so one of the things I did, one of the strategies I used was to look at the original fingerings of flamenco chord progressions and in a few cases, map those fingerings directly onto this new tuning with maybe a few adjustments here and there. Uh, one of the more common chord progressions that one finds in flamenco is a descending tetrachord bass. So for example, A to G to D to E. I, with the new tuning, I was able to rearrange the, or rethink the chords so that we actually have a kind of descending whole tone <laughs> bass. So it would be something like A, G, F, and E flat. So overall, the harmony sounds like a slightly distorted kind of flamenco chord progression. So now, with those bits of information done, I'd like to pass it on to uh, Nathan Fisher, who will discuss the technical aspects of playing the piece. Thank you, Aaron. Um, so I kind of want to, uh, I don't want to draw any direct comparisons between the Las Guitarras Azules and uh, the Aranjuez, but just to say that, you know, that Spanish flair that exists in the Aranjuez is in, in every student's heart. Everybody wants to play that piece. And, um, you know, it's, it's a difficult piece to study, it's a difficult piece to teach because there, there requires a, an element of uh, advanced arranging and um, understanding how things work and are laid out on the guitar when, when learning the Aranjuez. Um, 
th that said, this piece draws from the Spanish idiom and it does so beautifully and there are no edits required in playing the piece. Um, so in this case, it could work really well as an advanced pedagogical um, work leading up to something like the Aranjuez. Um, now, the orchestra and the guitar in this piece blend uh, in such a way that the guitar is heard and it, the orchestra and the guitar integrate, interact, and take turns um, so that no one is overshadowing the other. Uh, it's a beautiful arrangement. Um, in many ways, the guitar part takes its cues from the Spanish Renaissance where you have chordal harmonies in, in, in one sense, in this case, rasqueados, against uh, monophonic uh, scale-like figures, um, very much like the redobles. Um, and um, because it's so idiomatic for the guitar, it allows the guitarist to really focus on musicianship and the technical virtuosity. Um, there's not a lot of fighting weird things it's very natural. So I want to just kind of go back to what Aaron was saying about how we started this piece, and that is, um, I just remember one day, and I assume it would be in the spring, Aaron came over to my house and I was just sitting on my couch and, and I, would, I was just playing things that I was either learning or felt very comfortable playing, and Aaron s essentially observed me. and. I feel like when I open this score, many of those things were built into the composition. So there was no um, destination for me to work towards in terms of understanding how the techniques work and, and what to do. It, it felt very comfortable. So in terms of a collaboration um, for composers working with um, musicians, that was a that was an eye-opening experience for me. Um, and it was during a time in my life where I was sitting and reading a lot of flamenco books. So I, I was working on rasqueados and I was working on these kinds of things and, you know, fascinated by that. Um, so, um, yeah. So I'm going to start here with the Scorgitura because this is maybe the most challenging aspect of learning the piece is, just like any Scorgitura, uh, reading a 17-minute work in a new tuning is almost like learning the guitar all over again. That said, uh, the performance edition that we've produced um, will hopefully alleviate some of that um, learning curve, but you do get used to it, and it is a very beautiful harmonic sequence and, and easy to learn. Um, and what I wanted to do is show a couple of figures here with um, regard to, to how um, the, the, the work sits on the guitar. Um, the only thing I will say is when I played this live, um, the B flat at the very end of the top system, um, I left that out. I omitted that in performance because when strumming that, that, that chord to arrive on the beat, you have to start the strum before the beat. And um, I did the same thing with both of those harmonies. Uh, and I don't know if you, some people might not need that, but I felt like in order to arrive on those beats, um, I did. Um, so this right here is open string, right hand alone um, example taken from measure 17 there at the very top. And what I want to point out with the Scorgitura is that um, it enables, you know, with right hand crossings, with our middle finger, we want to lead as we move to strings closer to the floor, and with the index finger, uh, we want to lead shifting strings closer to the chin. And as a result of the tuning, the string crossings appear in duplets and quadruplets, which enables the right hand to move really well and really fluidly on the, on the guitar. So anybody who plays guitar and, and likes to, you know, write out your right hand alone um, will notice that this, there's no awkward string crossings whatsoever. And the piece lends itself very well to that. Um, there is the alzapua, which is a thumb picking technique. Again, you know, we have parallel sixth moving down um, with the alzapua on open strings. So this is something that you would see in soar, for example. And, um, well, maybe not the alzapua, but you would see figurations like this um, in, in guitar music. And because of the tuning, we're able to have the same choreography with the left hand, but have a new sound come out. It's also a common technique found in flamenco as well. Yeah, yeah, the alzapua is a very common technique in flamenco. 
Um, compound melodies appear um, so the writing doesn't get in the way of itself. Um, Aaron did not stack harmonies in the middle of um, melodic runs that you have to negotiate around. Um, and the use of tremolo um, didn't appear in the traditional sense, the five note uh, tremolo that you would have with uh, uh, flamenco, but we do get single string tremolo and then we get this tremolo figures leading to harmonies. Um, so I'm gonna play a few examples, starting with the boleras. Um, Here's a little bit of the guajiras. And finally, a little bit of the canto um, with the voice at the end. That uh, was from a recording in 2010 um, at the Jacobs School of Music with a new music ensemble conducted by David Zubé, and I was playing guitar. Um, so we have produced a performance edition of this work, which will be available on azharpress.com in the coming weeks. And um, I think I'd just like to, do you have anything else to add? Oh, no, the, well, the only thing I wanted to add is that the uh, soprano in that recording was Sharon Harms. Mm. Thank you. 
Um, if there's any questions, we'd be happy to take them now. Hello, and thank you so much for your wonderful uh, presentation. Many guitarists will oftentimes lament the fact that despite the fact that there are multiple wonderful concertos composed for the instrument, it seems, whether it's true or not, that most orchestras really only play the uh, Concerto de la Ruanjuez. So my question to you is, um, how have you both uh, tried to get in touch with orchestras or ensembles uh, to perform this work? Yeah, so part of our strategy is once we have the, um, the performance edition uh, prepared and printed um, with the recording, then we'll send it to conductors, um, starting with people we know, obviously, and moving on to maybe other orchestras that, that you know, just, if anything, to see if they would take an interest in the piece. It doesn't necessarily... It could be any performer playing it. I think that the, our goal is to get the piece played. Yeah. One thing I do want to add is that uh, since the premiere, I've made a number of changes to the orchestration itself and a few uh, additions that weren't in the original um, so that now I feel a lot more pleased with the current score. And so in a way, I kind of needed to wait a little bit in order to fix those things and for us to make this more comprehensive edition before we can start really plugging it to different ensembles. But uh, there are quite a few uh, contemporary music ensembles throughout the US, um, definitely some other organizations in Europe as well that we're gonna look into. So there is no more questions in person or from the virtual land. Thank you so much uh, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hello, my name is Joseph Klein. I'm a composer and I'm chair of the Division of Composition Studies at the University of North Texas College of Music. And my presentation today is Modular, Recombinant, and Concurrent Approaches to Musical Form, Two Recent Works with Guitar. First of all, I think it's probably a good idea to define some of the terms that I'm addressing in this talk. So the first one being Modular, which in contrast to fixed forms like Sonata, Allegro, Rondo form, or even linear processes like Fugue or Pasakaya, modular works are comprised of independent units or modules, which may be organized in a variety of ways. These are similar to like Lego bricks. If you can imagine the different sizes, colors, and shapes of the bricks might be equivalent to something like different textures, timbres, or rhythmic and harmonic content or dynamic qualities. The next term is recombinant. So this is a situation where the materials may be combined in multiple ways. These may occur either sequential or parallel, and even over the course of several works. And like Lego blocks, to kind of continue the analogy here, you can see how these blocks can be combined in different ways like this. This is very much analogous to a recombinant structure. 
The next term is concurrent, and here's where you have parallel unfolding of independent musical processes. And finally, nonlinearity comprises all of these different elements, and this is characterized by a lack of directionality or causal relationships. In other words, a non-teleological form. And in these kind of works, the listener has to bring their own meaning to the work as they kind of hear the structures unfold in various ways that are not in typical formal patterns, like again, sonata form, rondo. The first work I want to talk about is Kennedy Menagerie, and this is based on 19 solo works that were composed since 1997. And those works themselves are based on these characters in Elias Kennedy's book, Ear Witness. This book is a collection of these 50 idiosyncratic psychological character studies that I've used as kind of inspiration for these 19 solo instrumental works. Each instrument in this collection of works captures the musical essence of a given character through its distinctive timbral, articulative, technical, and dynamic qualities, thus defining its musical personalities. So here's a list of the Kennedy studies so far. These are individual solo works, and you can see the titles in German and then the translations, the various instruments they're composed for, the date of composition, and then the dedicatee. Kennedy Menagerie is a large-scale, open-form, semi-improvisational work that uses the material from the various solo works as fodder for improvisation. This work is based on another writing of Kennedy, Crowds and Power, from 1960. And whereas Kennedy's book, Ear Witness, is more of a psychological study focusing on these individual characters, Crowds and Powers is a sociological study that deals with crowd dynamics and large-scale human interaction. So as a result, this work serves as a metaphor for this larger-scale work, Kennedy Menagerie, which incorporates these various solo works in the improvisational texture, simulating a social gathering of these characters, exploring these various interactions of the crowd. As with any social gathering, the characters or the instruments themselves may contribute to a conversation or disrupt it. Interactions may be sympathetic, intimate, exuberant, confrontational, etc., just like any kind of social gathering you can imagine. A performance of Kennedy Menagerie may include any combination of five to eight of the instruments from this collection. So in other words, it's modular in that sense. And these can be grouped in continuously shifting duos, trios, and quintets. And so in this case, it's recombinant. Isolating the character study for the guitar, Der Dumutsana, we can look at some of the guitar characteristics that are featured in Kennedy Menagerie as one of the characters. So you have the distinctive attack and decay qualities of the guitar. You have harmonic possibilities, either arpeggiated or block chords. You have contrapuntal capabilities. There are microtonal possibilities. And of course, you have a wide timbral variety on the guitar including the different string colors and the positions of the hand and stopping the strings, the harmonics, use of supponticello, pitch bends, hammer-ons, etc. Now in Kanadi Menagerie itself, the guitar has various relationships with the other instruments. So for example, the resonant qualities of the guitar might be shared with the vibraphone of the piano, or the pluck sounds might be shared with the pizzicato strings, or you might have a contrast to the guitar sounds with the winds and bowed strings. And the guitar can also provide harmonic support to monophonic instruments. Here's an excerpt of Der Dumutsana, the solo guitar work, measures 15 to 20. And we can see there's actually four different modules that are being used in a linear fashion in here. These characteristic motives that serve as modules include these arpeggiated figures that are accelerando and retardando figures that happen throughout the work. These harmonic pitches that happen also in other parts of the work and are broken apart. These rapidly reiterated notes and finally, these fragmented melodic figures with chordal accompaniment. So this is a good example in just one excerpt here of these four modules used in a linear fashion. And now I'm going to play an excerpt of Der Demutsana from that same passage featuring guitarist Joseph Mirandia.
Having now heard an excerpt of Der Mutsana for solo guitar, we can now move on to Canetti Menagerie and see how the guitar fits in the larger group improvisational texture. This diagram shows a timeline of Canetti Menagerie in the particular performance at the University of North Texas in September of 2016. And you can see that there's uh, various combinations of these instruments here. As I mentioned, duos, trios, and quintets. So you can see if we go through, the first section is the duo between the violin and the cello, followed by a trio and the bass and horn and violin and cello. And then the violin leaves the texture, and it's just a duo between the bass and horn and the cello. Then the piccolo enters, so now we have a trio between the piccolo, bass and horn, and cello, and so on. Duo, then a quintet with five of the performers there, then a trio comes out of that. And the violin leaves, we have another duo, and then we have a kind of interruptive texture here where this conversation is interrupted by these other three instruments, piccolo, trumpet, and guitar, and then in a trio, and then the trumpet leaves the texture and ends up being a duo. And this process continues throughout this realization of the work. So I'm going to play two excerpts from this performance, both featuring guitar. And the first excerpt here, uh, listen for the guitar harmonics in combination with the percussionist playing vibraphone, and you hear the kind of resonant qualities brought out between those two in that particular conversation. And the second excerpt here at the end of the piece, when the guitar enters, you will hear particularly the combination of guitar and cello with pizzicato cello parts. So with that, let's listen to these two excerpts from Kennedy Menagerie, paying particular attention to how the guitarist uses the specific modular materials in their demutsana in the improvisation. And the guitarist here is Chaz Underreiner. The next work I want to discuss is an underwork Cosmos, and this is a modular cycle of 19 works for various chamber ensembles and soloists, combined about 60 performers total. These modules that comprise the work are characterized by distinctive timbral, rhythmic, dynamic, and pitch characteristics. And among them you have standard ensembles such as string quartet, saxophone quartet, brass trio, and there are several unique instrumental combinations as well, some of which are homogeneous combinations like guitar, harp, harpsichord, which are all pluck sounds, or metal percussion and piano, which are resonant sounds, or piccolo, celesta, and flexitone, which are high frequency sounds. 
And you also have uh, heterogeneous combinations of instruments, such as contrabassoon plus wood blocks and log drums, or percussion plus brass and piano. And then finally, there are solo instruments in the collection, one for E-flat clarinet, one for piccolo trumpet, one for violin, and one for xylophone. There are two modules with guitar that I'll be discussing today. So one is a fleeting symmetry, which is for guitar, harp, and harpsichord. So it's one of the homogeneous ensembles. And the other is a delicate geometry, which is for countertenor, electric guitar, and accordion. So that's one of the heterogeneous ensembles. This is a list of all 19 modules in an underwear cosmos, organized from smallest ensemble, solo, all the way to the largest, which is from six to 20 performers. And you can see here the guitar modules are both trios in there. And on the columns on the right, it also indicates the temporality of each module. So some of them are intermittent, some are sectional, some are continuous, some are recurring. And there's also various characters of these modules. Some are assertive, some are neutral, some are varied, some are passive. Just again, like those Lego bricks that we looked at earlier, where each one has its own shape, size, and color. Each of these modules has its own distinctive characteristic. This is an excerpt from A Fleeting Symmetry. So as you can see, it's for plucked strings, all have a kind of similar timbral quality and attack quality, relatively quick decay. They're organized in these rapidly ornamented pitch constellations and linearly intertwined. As you can see here, even the notation kind of shows how they're all interconnected with one another. This module is characterized by an oscillating increase and decrease of textural density in these kind of repeating cyclical patterns. And here is an excerpt from the other guitar module, A Delicate Geometry. Here the guitar functions as part of a heterogeneous composite texture. So the voice uh, is comprised of these sustained continuous transformations of formants on a single tone. The electric guitar, as you can see here, has these clearly articulated attacks, very resonant with these wide intervals, primarily major sevenths and minor ninths. And the accordion has these continuously swelling clusters. This particular module is characterized by these intermittent iterations of harmonically static blocks separated by silence of varying durations. So it's in itself contrasting from the previous guitar module. Here's a modular timeline of an excerpt of An Underwear Cosmos. This is from the performance that was presented last night by the BSU New Music Ensemble. And you can see this is color coded. So each of the movements in this particular realization are color coded accordingly. And here is a setup diagram for that performance last night with the varying ensembles. And you can see actually that the percussionist was involved in two different modules, a Noble Ideal and Celestial Teapot. So moved back and forth between those two. The next example here is an excerpt from an underwear cosmos in this reduced chamber setting with the International Contemporary Ensemble. And you can hear uh, fleeting symmetry is featured in this particular excerpt.
This is a setup diagram of a performance that was done at the University of North Texas in October of 2018 that included all 19 modules. And this was performed in Winspear Hall in the Murkison Performing Arts Center. And the performers were spread throughout the entire hall, as you can see on the diagram at the right. This is a timeline for that particular performance. So you can see that each of the modules is indicated on the left and the color coding showing how those modules are unfolded with the various cues throughout. So I'm going to play an excerpt from this timeline here in the performance at the Murkison Performing Arts Center that featured the International Contemporary Ensemble, the Nova Ensemble, the Melange Saxophone Quartet, and several UNT student and faculty performers. Please note that both of the guitar modules, a fleeting symmetry and a delicate geometry, are included in this particular realization, but you'll hear a completely different context from the previous example.
So that concludes my lecture on modular, recombinant, and concurrent approaches to musical form in two recent works with guitar. I thank you for listening, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Joseph, for that wonderful lecture, and especially for the performance of uh, your work by uh, the Ball State uh, University New Music Ensemble last night. It was really lovely. Oh, thank um, you very much. Um, so we're going to uh, first sort of ask uh, for people watching online, if you have a question for Joseph, uh, just put a comment in Facebook or YouTube and we'll see it right away. If there are people here in uh, Zoom, uh, who would like to ask a question, then uh, simply you'll have to unmute your mic and uh, open your video and you can ask your question directly. Um, so I have a very brief uh, question for you um, just to get started. So I know that you've written uh, a few um, guitar specific uh, only works, a solo guitar piece, guitar duo, and one for guitar ensemble. Um, do you see yourself writing more pieces for solo guitar? Or is uh, or other types of guitar only ensembles? Uh, well, yeah, it's interesting you ask that because um, I went to a relatively small music program as an undergrad, Cal Poly Pomona, which was not really known for music. I actually went there to be a microbiology major, so um, kind of defected to music in my second year. Um, but we didn't have a very big department, and most of the people in the department were guitarists or singers. So I wrote a lot of guitar music and a lot of vocal music, and a lot of the guitar music I wrote, I don't really show in the public anymore. Um, but it was kind of funny because of this conference, I you know got two big pieces for guitar that are from the 20th century. So they're not really appropriate in a 21st century guitar conference. Um, but uh, I've always loved the guitar and I've always been, it's one of those instruments that for a composer, unless you play it, it has a lot of mysterious aspects, you know? And the other thing that I've found working with, particularly the Elgar Yates guitar duo, Peter Yates and Matthew Elgar, who did a lot of prepared guitar work in the 80s. And um, that's the group I wrote my duo for that um, they performed many, many times. Um, the thing I always was fascinated by the guitar is that there's so many different ways of playing things. And so I would have these chords and the one guitarist, Peter might look at it and try to figure out how to do it. And Matt would have another, it's like, oh, just do it like this, you know, because, and just realizing as a non-guitarist, there's, you just have to really, dissect the fretboard and figure out how to, or the fingerboard and figure out how to, you know, make it work on the instrument, I guess. So, uh, and so, and also just the coloristic possibilities, which are what really attracted me to the instrument and in both the solo piece and the two, um, the chamber pieces, the the Kennedy Menagerie and Underwear Cosmos, because it's just such a, you know, wealth of color. And, and particularly when you have electric guitar and acoustic guitar, the possibilities even between the two of them. So, so I, I love writing for it. If I have more opportunities, I will certainly do it. So um, you know, I'm looking for another opportunity anytime, I guess. <laughs> uh, putting the call out there. Um, yeah. Yes, it's funny that you say about uh, dissecting the fretboard. The other way to do it is make uh, very good friends with a guitarist and give them a <laughs> bottle of wine or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's for sure. I mean, I, I just that's my modus operandi with any uh, composition is work with the performers. I, I'm a bassoonist and a percussionist myself. And even if I'm working for those instruments, I'm talking to the performer because they might think of the instruments differently than I think about them. And I've written, I've played some of my own percussion music and I find myself when I'm the performer, I start to rearrange things that I've you know written in the score. Like, here's the way the, the percussionist should be laid out. And so even you know, my own perspective as a performer, it's a different than my perspective as a composer. So you're right, definitely make friends with guitarists <laughs> and all musicians and, you know, wine is always a, you know, <laughs> necessity. <laughs> um, so I, I think there are some people in uh, Zoom that may have a question. Uh, I'm just going to say, unmute your mic and open your video if you have one. Go ahead, Thatcher. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Professor Klein, for your wonderful uh, lecture. Um, 
So I saw that you are a composition professor at University of North Texas, which in addition to having, of course, a wonderful classical guitar program under the direction of uh, Tom Johnson, uh, you, uh, University of North Texas is also one of the most famous uh, jazz schools in the United States. I was wondering, uh, given the way that you compose using the guitar in untraditional uh, ensembles, have you ever considered uh, writing a piece uh, at UNT featuring some classical guitar players and some jazz guitar players together? That would be very interesting. And I, you know, I neglected to mention in the lecture that um, the guitarist in the um, uh, International Contemporary Ensemble is Daniel, Dan LaPel, he was playing there. And the guitarist that was in the, uh, the module with the electric guitar was Davey Mooney, who's on the faculty here at UNT. And Davey's a fantastic guitarist. And I wanted a jazz guitar sound. But it's interesting because, and he's a great musician, and of course more comfortable with the jazz idiom. And so when he played this piece, which happens to be one of my favorite of the modules, because it's just the weirdest ensemble with electric guitar and countertenor and accordion. It's just the most bizarre combination. And the players were really fantastic. And Davey, it was very interesting working with Davey because it was completely out of the norm for him as a jazz guitarist, even though I really wanted that jazz guitar, very clean sound. Um, but he, you know, he totally pulled it off, did a great job. And I think he was afraid he wasn't doing it right. It sounded fantastic, but it made me think of a lot about the idea of that kind of combination. And, and you're right. We do have a really incredible classical guitar and jazz guitar program. Um, and the one thing about UNT is it's a huge school. So we have like 1600 music majors. So it's kind of, it's the one place I could pull off the entire performance of Underwear Cosmos, which had 60 performers in it. So I basically put that 60 performers together myself. Um, you couldn't do that at a lot of other schools. Um, but that's, that's a really great question. I have to think about the idea because I actually am thinking about writing a, a solo guitar module or a solo guitar piece in a Kinetti series uh, to, as a kind of companion piece to the to the um, acoustic guitar piece. And, and perhaps in those in that situation, the two can play together in the Kennedy Menagerie um, open form improvisational work. So that would be a really interesting combination in there. So maybe one of these days I'll get a chance to do that. Thanks for the question. I hope I answered it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, he writes, thanks a lot. Good. Um, great, so we'll just uh, leave the uh, floor open for a few more questions if there are some. Yeah, and I wanted to say just before people are coming up with questions that uh, it was I was really appreciative of the performance last night. I thought the BSU New Music Ensemble did a great job. And uh, for me, I told Amy earlier, for me not to be involved directly in the performance, it was nice to hear what other another group came up with in their combination of the modules. So we, we kind of worked out a, a game plan, but then they had some liberty as far as how they were going to unfold it. So I thought they did a really fine job with it. So my thanks to them. So I don't see any more questions. Uh, so we'll be moving to our next lecture now, but I just wanna say a deep thank you to Joseph for both for the um, performance last night and also your lecture and the answer, generous answers to your questions. Thank you very much. And a great conference. You're doing a great job with like all the moving parts and trying to coordinate online and live and all that. So I'm very impressed. Well, fortunately we have a fantastic team online, Michelle, and also yeah. at BSU, of course. Yeah, great. Congratulations and thank you again. Thank you. So our next uh, lecturer will be Harry, uh, Harry Staphylakis, and uh, it, that will be coming up in just a few moments.
Hello everyone, thanks for joining me for this talk, Composing Across Eight Strings, and thank you to the 21st Century Guitar Conference for inviting me this year. I'm Haralavos Harry Stefalakis, a composer based in New York City. I teach at the City University of New York, and since 2016 have served as composer in residence of the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra and co-curator of its Winnipeg New Music Festival. As it happens, tonight in Ottawa, Canada, the Chikiliti Cowan Duo and 13 Strings Chamber Orchestra will be giving the world premiere of my concerto for two guitars, To Wake and Find the World Still Burning. Uh, so it's serendipitous that I'm joining you here at a guitar conference to talk about my relationship with the instrument. Um, as you might have guessed from my surroundings here in the studio, the guitar is my primary instrument. I began my music studies at the age of four with a piano. But around the age of 13, my growing interest in rock and eventually metal music uh, led me to transition to the electric guitar. Soon enough, I was playing in bands, uh, at first playing covers, then co-writing songs with my bandmates, then writing entirely on my own, as my tastes and growing compositional skills plunged me increasingly into the complexities of progressive metal and to my own uh, personal artistic vision. Eventually, in my mid-20s, I returned to classical music as a composer, at which time I also studied classical guitar for several years, primarily with Patrick Kearney and uh, Gary Antonio in Montreal. Uh, though I stopped being a performing musician in 2010 so that I could focus on developing my compositional career, I did not leave the guitar behind by any means. Uh, it remained one of my principal compositional tools, as well as one of my favorite instruments to compose for. These are the things I'll be delving into today. If I were a 19th century composer and kept track of my works by opus number, my two guitar concerto that's being premiered tonight would be my opus 75. Of those 75-ish works, that doesn't include ones that I've deleted over the years, as well as my purely metal compositions, 14 of them include guitar in the instrumentation, which is a fairly large fraction uh, for a composer of classical music. Here is a list of those works. As you can see, these range from solos, duos, and quartets to ensemble and concerto type works. The pieces that include classical guitar all have the instrument in either standard or drop D tuning, as I feel that those tunings work best for the typical concert classical setup, the way that most players have them adjusted. The pieces that include electric guitar are more flexible with six string, seven string, and eight string guitars called for in a variety of tunings, which I'll talk a bit about later. I'd like to share a sampling of my guitar writing here from some of these pieces listed. So first, I'd like to play a couple excerpts from one of my earliest pieces, Hyperion, which was originally written for and premiered by Canadian Jordanian guitarist Tarek Harb. The recording you're going to hear in a moment is from the latest album, Nove, by Canadian guitarist Patrick Kearney. Uh, in this excerpt from the first movement and into the second movement, you'll hear a rather traditional approach to the classical guitar with cantabile melody supported by largely homophonic chordal voicings. Towards the end of the movement, the writing deviates a bit as a militaristic metal-like riff begins to emerge on the low E string, taking advantage of Kearney's powerful thumb tremolo technique. Thank you. 
In the second movement, I wanted the solo guitar to have the energy and power of a full band. So the writing becomes increasingly untraditional. Uh, you'll note here the prevalence of strumming and powerful rest strokes to emulate the effect of electric guitars reinforced with unison bass and drums. Nine years after that piece, uh, I was fortunate to collaborate for the first time with Adam Ciccoliti and Steve Cowan, composing my first guitar duo, Focus, which I've performed all over the place, including at the very first edition of this conference, uh, and is featured on their award-winning album, also titled Focus. Here, the metal stylings of my guitar writing are even more prevalent, especially in the first movement. After a delicate intro, the two players launch into a riff-oriented two-guitar assault that would be at home in a song by modern metal bands like Opeth or Nevermore.
final example, this time for electric guitar, for stylistic comparison. Uh, so during the pandemic, I had the pleasure of collaborating with Courtney Swain, who's the lead singer of the American prog rock band Bent Knee, on a composition that brought together our mutual influences from classical, metal, prog, and indie pop. Uh, the result was Don't Wait For Me, a multi-movement suite for a mixed ensemble that includes typical contemporary ensemble instruments, flute, clarinet, violin, cello, and piano, here performed by the New York City Hip Hop Meets Classical Ensemble, Shout House. Uh, also includes voice with Courtney Swain herself singing, electric guitar and bass with me playing, drums by Bent Knees, Gavin Wallace Aylesworth, and electronics. Uh, here's an excerpt that begins in the fifth movement leading into the sixth and final movement of the piece. So the piece to this point will have been navigating through a variety of ensemble writing styles, uh, but with a metal component largely withheld. Finally, it bursts forth here. As is typical in contemporary progressive metal, the foundation of the music here is double tracked electric guitar riff played here on my Ibanez seven string in drop A flat. Many of the instruments of the ensemble are doubling or otherwise supporting the rhythm guitars here, while the rest float above this foundational layer, playing around with the soaring lead guitar that comes in part way through the passage. Though of course a low tuned seven string electric guitar with a modern high gain tone is quite a different beast from the classical guitar, the writing itself doesn't differ all that much from some parts of the previous examples I played from Hyperion and Focus. Thank you. 
changing tack a bit here, I wanted to add some notes about the guitar as a compositional tool. Though only some of my music includes guitar in the instrumentation, many more of them, from chamber to vocal to orchestral, were written at least in part with the guitar in hand. Traditionally, most composers were pianists, or at least used the piano as their primary compositional tool. And that certainly applies to me. There's just no substitute for the massive range and harmonic flexibility of the piano. It remains the primary piece of furniture at which I do my composing. However, having fluency in both classical, so finger style, and electric, or picked guitar, affords me some compositional advantages, because the guitar is much closer in structure and playing technique to the bowed string family than the piano is. And of course, the bowed strings, without question, serve as the heart of the symphony orchestra and of the classical repertoire in general. Uh, essentially, I can use the guitar not just to generate musical ideas, but more specifically, to work out melodic parts, counterpoint, and even exact string parts. Um, of course, the guitar differs in many respects from the bowed strings, which can limit its applicability as a compositional instrument when writing for other instruments. Firstly, the sustain or ADSR envelope of the guitar. The guitar is effectively a percussion instrument because once you strike a string, it immediately begins to decay unlike bowed strings, whose dynamic envelope is controlled in real time through every moment of each note's duration. That's where the electric guitar is most useful to me with the use of a volume pedal, volume knob, distortion, compression, reverb, and delay, as well as secondary tools like an ebo or a slide. I can recreate to varying degrees the sustain and volume control of a bowed string instrument effectively closing the gap between the instrument families. The other fa main factor here is tuning. Simply put, bowed strings are tuned in fifths, the guitar is tuned in fourths and a third. Uh, there is therefore a substantial difference in what intervals, chords, arpeggios, whatever, are created by our familiar finger patterns. And of course, the lack of overlap between the open strings of the guitar on one hand and the violin or cello on the other can limit the guitar's usefulness in working out string parts. Again, there are workarounds. In my studio, I have numerous instruments that all can be used for different functions. My two classical guitars are handy to quickly pick up so I can work out an idea that's in my head or just to noodle around while I'm watching TV, giving me a handheld medium to generate inspiration. The steel string acoustic serves a similar purpose, but is much brighter, faster, and spankier. Uh, so it's effective for working out more percussive and propulsive musical ideas. Uh, it also takes more easily to retuning, so I can quickly drop D or go to an open chord tuning to work out an idea in a key that would otherwise be difficult to work in on guitar. Um, then there are three electric guitars, all of them Ibanez S series models with different numbers of strings. I have each of them in a different tuning so as to allow me to conveniently explore musical ideas across all keys of the chromatic spectrum. The sixth string is usually tuned to drop C, effectively making it a C minor or C instrument. This allows me to work on the near flat side keys or the part of the circle of the fifths. My seventh string is usually tuned to drop A flat or drop G sharp putting me on the knee, on the far flat side or far sharp side of the circle of fifths. Usually difficult keys like G sharp minor or E flat minor thus become a non-issue. The eighth string is tuned to drop E or F sharp standard, which covers the usual keys that guitar is good for, from zero to four sharps generally, uh, but even more so because of the additional low B and low E or F sharp strings opens up the possibilities, the bass voicings a lot more. Uh, it's worth adding here that the range of a 24 fret eight string guitar alone has become absolutely essential to me as an orchestral composer. Looking at the open strings of the instrument and the fretted notes up through the entire first string, the total range of this one instrument that I can hold in my hands is effectively that of the entire string choir of an orchestra from double bass without C extension, to modestly high violin. And then just for good measure, I have a mandolin hanging around, which I keep in standard tuning, G, D, A, E, which is, of course, the exact tuning and range 
of the violin. Since I'm useless with a violin bow, but fully comfortable with a pick, the mandolin is an ideal stand-in for me to work out more technical or virtuosic string passages with a fair degree of confidence that they'll fit idiomatically in a violinist's hands. I could go on forever on this subject, but of course, you all have other things to do, so I'll leave the monologue here. Uh, I look forward to hearing your questions, comments, or observations, and talking just a little bit more according to whatever interests you. Thank you so much for joining me for this talk. Thank you so much, uh, Harry, for that wonderful lecture. Of course, I, I know some of these pieces. I've heard them before, especially Focus. Um, and I guess one of the questions that came to mind when listening to your lecture, oh, would you be able to mute your stream? Is it not muted? It is. OK. My apologies. <laughs> right. Technical mishap. Um, so one of the questions that came to my mind when I was listening to it is obviously you're translating metal into a classical environment in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. And it seems like one of the more evident, obvious things that you're working with is uh, rhythmic and metrical structures. But I was curious whether there's any translation of the timbral qualities of metal into classical, particularly classical guitar, because of course you can't really translate metal guitar one-to-one -to, -one to the classical guitar. Right. So are there techniques that you use or is that something that you're aware of when you're composing? Yeah, well, of course, uh, the yeah, I didn't go into it into great detail for the sake of time uh, in, in my actual presentation, but uh, all of the pieces that are presented in some way do that. And I'd say the more recent, the more that, that they do that uh, amongst other things. So one of the, a common kind of idioms of uh, modern gent or progressive metal uh, guitar playing is the kind of bluesy kind of partial bend, the quarter quarter tone to, to semitone uh, bend at the end towards the end of a note. Uh, so that's incorporated. You might have seen that in focus where they were being asked to do uh, these little swoops up from notes. Uh, palm mutes, uh, which have been used in both um, uh, Hyperion and Focus and my other kind of classical guitar Focus works. So, of course, we have pizzicato in classical guitar, uh, but I very much like explicitly call it palm mute and, and write it the way I would for electric guitar to create that percussive non-sustained sound that is such an, uh, an iconic sound of the electric guitar in metal music. Uh, Lots of use of sulpont and molto sulponti cello uh, to bring out the brightness, the harsh attack, the kind of thinner tone for greater clarity, articulation, uh, that sort of thing. Um, in general, just in general, just the, the 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 approach to the kinds of patterns that even the left hand is playing, um, the shapes look like they are metal riffs that one is playing, uh, and often, as you'll see, if uh, you ever watch. Uh, Adam Chikilidi and Steve Cowan playing Focus, for instance, or my concerto for tonight, uh, they're often using their index fingers like picks. So they're playing, you know, as if they're playing electric guitar uh, to get that kind of fast alternate picking kind of sound. So those are among the gestures that are, are typically translated into my classical guitar writing. And is, is there translation when you're going uh, to non-guitar instruments? Like if you're incorporating temporal things into an ensemble without a guitar. 
Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, many of the same ones just adjusted in different ways. So for instance, I think it was my string quartet number three, which I wrote for the Catuar Bottini, coincidentally. Um, I also used the Genti bend, the kind of a blues chord tone bend uh, in that one, particularly in the second movement. Uh, and also, I think it was their suggestion when I was, I gave like a technical marking, like a character marking of sound during a section that was particularly prog metal riff oriented. Um, and it was kind of wordy and I was trying to be super precise. And they said, uh, can you just say like quasi electric guitar? I'm like, yeah, that's it. So in the score now, it just says quasi electric guitar. So uh, it, it was a combination of sul ponte cello, off the bow, uh, off the string playing, um, a slight overpressure to add to the distortion effect of the kind of high gain metal sound and so on. So th that's just one example of how that might translate. But with every instrument of the orchestra of the classical instrumentation in general uh, there are certain things that i can or at least try to do that are similar to what one would hear in a metal band in a contemporary metal band uh, and i try to find things that are both common already idiomatic to their language to to their repertoire uh, that would be recognizable to them techniques or uh, technique markings uh, as well as come up with my own and just create a notation legend i keep it as simple as possible but uh, sometimes i do need to create a bit of a list of this is how you do this i even link like youtube videos of metal bands like check out this riff at this moment in the piece that's what it should sound like you know that sort of thing Great, um, and I think Thatcher Harrison has come in. Uh, Thatcher, do you have a question? Sure, uh, thank you so much for your uh, wonderful lecture. And uh, I must say, I loved the examples that I heard. Absolutely wonderful. Um, so I couldn't help but notice in your bio that you uh, have spent a lot of time in Montreal. And of course that shows with the work that you've done with Patrick Kearney and uh, Chiquiti and Cowan. Uh, but I also saw that you're uh, teaching in New York and um, one could make the argument that Montreal and New York are perhaps the two uh, greatest cities uh, for new music in guitar. Now, uh, the new music that someone like a Patrick Kearney might work with might be different than the type of new music that someone like a David Starobin might work with. But, um, but I was wondering, have you worked with or are you planning on working with any uh, New York-based guitarists on any new music projects? Uh, thank you so much oh. for your time. Thanks so much, Thatcher. I, I appreciate your comments and question. Uh, that's a good uh, question. I mean, uh, uh, I've had colleagues come to New York to play. Patrick Kearney has been here and has performed Hyperion in New York. Uh, 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 Cow and Chickalady have performed Focus. Wait, maybe not in New York, but in Philadelphia. Close enough. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm friends with uh, uh, David Leisner and uh, Jordan Dodson. I've talked with uh, Jordan about uh, doing my quintet for guitar and strings, Critical Density. Somehow things haven't really coalesced for me, but I haven't sought out the classical guitar world in particular in New York. And so I haven't kind of forged those uh, collaborations, but I'd love to, obviously. Uh, I'm just not particularly, I haven't been particularly tied to the classical guitar world since moving to New York in 2011. I very much was growing up and living in Montreal for 28 years. Uh, so yeah, not yet, but hey, I, I, I welcome anybody who wants to collaborate. I'm down for it. I love writing for guitar and working with guitarists. They, they maybe sometimes don't love working with me just because I actually know the instrument. So <laughs> no, no, you can actually play that. No. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Harry. And we're just going to say that if anyone is watching uh, online, if you have a question, just put it in Facebook and YouTube comments and we'll see it right away. Uh, and if there's any other additional questions uh, from Zoom, we'll just wait a moment. One thing that I don't have yet, incidentally, is a, a guitar concerto, solo guitar concerto. I have a two guitar concerto, but not a solo guitar concerto. Well, you're going to have to put that on your schedule, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't see any further questions, so we'll leave it there. But thank you so much for uh, that wonderful lecture. And I look forward to hearing your piece tonight with Adam and Steve, uh, Adam, Adam Chickalitti and Steve Cowan. Likewise, Amy, looking forward to hearing yours. Um, and uh, so our next uh, performance is going to be by the wonderful duo Triangle, who are going to be playing works by Julius Eastman, the Honorable Elizabeth A. Baker, and Joshua Marquez. And that's coming up in just a moment. Thank you, Amy.
Welcome to SIRSA Performance Hall. As a courtesy to the performers and other audience members, we ask that you please take a moment to turn off and put away all electronic devices. If you are using your device to view the program, please silence all notifications and dim the screen. In keeping with copyright laws and artist agreements, the use of recording and photographic equipment is permitted only by approved university personnel. We also remind you that no food, drink, or gum is permitted in the concert hall. We ask that you please remain seated throughout the performance, and if you must exit, that you wait until applause. Thank you and enjoy the performance.